Last week, we started to look at the issue of the mark of the beast. There are, there are so many things that we need to zero in on that it, it will take us a while to complete all the different elements of this particular emphasis. I mean, when you're talking about the beast and the mark of the beast, especially the mark of the beast, there are quite a number of things that we need to look at. So what I'm going to do first of all this afternoon is do a quick review of the big picture. Then we will come back now to chapter the mark of the beast and we'll start discussing it a little more closely. So let's do a quick review of the um the points we made. And the reason I'm doing this is because I, I, I have a, a conviction that the most important thing is that we we can see the big picture. If we can if we are able to zoom out and see the big picture, we can always fit the pieces. I keep saying this week after week, but it's still true, and I still feel that I still feel that burden on my heart to try to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen and just quickly take a brief review of some of the things we have looked at. Now, at this point in this section, if you don't understand what I'm saying, if you don't understand the picture I present, please stop me, okay? I want to know that you understand. That's the most important thing. So, all right, here goes. And I imagine everybody can see my screen. All right. So, <clears throat> there's nothing on the screen, but here it comes. What we saw was that the first three chapters of Revelation, basically, I categorized them as an introduction. There is important information there, but we, we left it out because I believe chapter 4 to chapter 19 is where the main body of the message is. The book of Revelation is really focused on chapters 4 to 19. And so that's what we are focusing on. So I think chapter 1 to 3 is, 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 is introduction. Then we saw that there was part 1, which goes from chapter 4 to 11, which deals with the judgment of the kingdom of Christ. And chapter 12 to 19, which deals with the judgment of the kingdom of the beast. Chapters 20 to 22 is like, hmm, I don't have that there. Anyway, it's like an epilogue. It's like the closing remarks. So what we, we are really focusing on in our studies is the judgment of Christ's kingdom and the judgment of the beast kingdom. These two great uh, divisions. And once you get this, we, 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 we are beginning to make some progress. It's like, if you think of it like the Old and the New Testament, in a way, once you divide the Bible into Old and New Testament, then you can know this book is Old Testament, this is New Testament, and you can start to get a picture that way. So look at this, kind of like that. All right, I'm going to skip this because I have a better view. Now, the first thing we saw in part one, judgment of Christ's kingdom is, it consists of the seven seals. That's what the judgment of the kingdom of Christ is about. So, Jesus took the book from the hand of his father, and that's where we had it, the seven seals. And the seven seals covers everything concerning the kingdom of Christ. Everything comes under the seven seals. So that covers from chapter 4 to chapter 11. That's the seven seals. So, but within the seven seals, when you come to seal number 7, it opens up a set of sub-events. Sub-events. And these sub-events are the seven trumpets. So you have seven seals, it covers everything. But within the seventh seal, it zooms in a little and takes you into the details of the seven trumpets. Furthermore, when you come to the seventh trumpet, it takes you into the end of all things. It takes you to the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. The kingdom of Christ destroys the kingdom of this world, take them over, and the mystery of God is finished. 
So that should be easy to understand. What you remember, first of all, seven seals. And seal number seven, the seven trumpets. Seventh trumpet takes you to the end. That's part one of Revelation. Then you come to part two. Part two is about the conflict between the dragon and the woman and the seed of the woman. So that's the big picture. So let's zoom in a little bit now and see what we see. When you zoom in, you see that uh, the dragon, he makes war against the seed of the woman and he, 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 he calls two agents. One of them is a beast and the other one is a false prophet. In chapter 13 of Revelation, they are described as two beasts, but it's the beast and the false prophet. That's the name given to the second one later on. He's called a false prophet. So this is the first, let's say the first box in part two. Part two, the judgment of, of the kingdom of the devil or the, the revelation of Satan's kingdom. So the Satan has two agents that he's working through. These two agents bring the mark of the beast. That's the second thing. Mark of the beast. And within the mark of the beast, you have two things happening. First of all, you have the, the final preaching of the gospel on the earth. The three angels' messages. And then the harvest follows. These are events that take place as a result of the mark of the beast. So under the mark of the beast, you have the preaching of the third angel's message. You have the harvesting of the earth. And if you want to go into detail, we can say it also involves the sealing of God's people and the day of atonement, all of that. But um, based on what we see in Revelation 14, is the preaching of the three angels' messages and the harvesting of the earth. And after that, we move to the third emphasis, which is the seven last plagues. When the seven last plagues is, are poured out, the inhabitants, the, the, the unrepentant people are plagued by these plagues and a special, special attention is given to Babylon. Babylon is fallen and she is, she's, she's looted and she's, she is destroyed or at least badly damaged by the ten horns. And the fourth event we see in this part too is the coming of Jesus in Revelation 19. Although he's represented as riding a, a white horse. He, he, he returns. And as a consequence. The beast and the false prophet are given to the flame. And Satan is chained in the bottomless pit. So you can look at part two as four events. Part one you can see as three events. It's the seven seals. The seven trumpets. And the coming of Jesus. Here you see four events. The 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 dragon calling two beasts, the mark of the beast, then the, um, the seven plagues, then the coming of Jesus. Just those, these four events. And that basically is the overview of the book of Revelation. The two, the two sections that we consider to be most important. Now let me pause a little bit. Is there, is there anything about what we just looked at? That needs clarification. Anybody? It's a beautiful thing to ask a question like that and see no hands going up. <laughs> it makes makes me feel like I did a good job. But go ahead, Brother Judah. Now, little question. Um, the woman riding the beast. I didn't hear any mention of her, the role that that, that plays. All right. I, I actually have left out a few things. I left out the the ceiling of the one forty four thousand. I left out the ministry of the two witnesses. I left out the description of the woman riding the beast. And the reason is because I'm looking at the big picture. Those are like those are explanations that God brought in, not in the pattern of the story. They they are like they are like explanations to explain aspects of the story. So they're not the main theme. What I just looked at are the main events. Now, somewhere in those main events, you're going to have the ceiling of the 144,000. You're going to have the ministry of the two witnesses. You're going to have 
Babylon riding the beast. But those are like, those are not a part of the narrative. Those are things that God brought in to explain something that was happening somewhere else. So I hope, I hope what I just said makes sense. So if we look at, if we look at the detailed picture, of course we have to put them in. But when we are doing an overview, we leave them out so that, you know, we don't, we don't confuse the, the, the sequence, the narrative. Brother Michael, go ahead. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So if the judgment of Christ's kingdom is the first half, and then the second half is the judgment of the beast kingdom, the beast kingdom has existed longer than Christ's kingdom. Uh, yes. So does the, in, the beginning parts of that actually go a little bit before the first seal? It goes, it, it, if, you, if you look at the description of the beast with the seven heads, it goes way back to the beginning of the history of the earth after the flood. It goes way back. But the, the, the Bible does give us a little, the book of Revelation does give us a little hint of this because it shows you the beast having seven heads and it shows you the dragon making war against the woman in Revelation 12. But the, the focus of Revelation is the last conflict, the time of the judgment. And so it really begins in chapter 13 because chapter 13 is where we see the judgment corresponding to what happens in the first section. In section one, it begins with the judgment in heaven and it begins with this. The seven seals take us back to the time of the apostolic church. Yes, but we are reviewing history. And in the same way, the, 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 the conflict between the dragon and the woman takes us back to the apostolic church at the time when this, the man child was brought forth. So, so both stories begin with the time of Christ or just right after the time of Christ because what we are looking at is the history of the two kingdoms since the kingdom of Christ was set up, since the time of Christ. We are looking at the judgment of the church and the church did not exist before Christ or the judgment of the kingdom. And so since we are looking at the kingdom of Christ, we are looking also at the kingdom of, of the beast where, when it stands against the kingdom of Christ. Both kingdoms are being compared. So we start them at the same time. The judgment is not interested in Babylon, Medo Persia, or Greece, or Egypt, or Assyria. It's interested in Rome versus the kingdom of Christ. So, so both, both narratives begin with the apostolic church round about that time. So the ancient kingdoms are almost like an after. It's, it's just a part of the beast, but it's not focused on. Okay, I see. Exactly. The, the, the ancient kingdoms are mentioned because they help us to identify the beast. They help us to understand Satan's, how, the, the depth of Satan's work over the ages. You see, it, 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 it's if you, the, the, how we can know this because when we look at the dragon, he has seven heads. It's the history of Satan. And, and the seven heads is a history of the beast from the beginning. But we, we are, Revelation is really um, concerned about in the age of the kingdom of Christ. So it's since the kingdom was set up because it's a judgment of two kingdoms. So you have to judge, you have to assess them beginning at the same time, going through the same point of history. So yes, brother, brother Micah. Thank you. You're welcome. So, all right. So we're going to move on now. To continue our study at the mark of the beast and and my 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 expectation is that everybody can can look at the chart and know exactly where we are you can look at these images we just looked at the charts we just looked at and you can know exactly where we are and why we're there and what is happening here that is what i really want to see happen you know i don't want us to be be, be going through disjointed events that you can't make the connection my prayer and my hope and my intention is that everybody who goes through these studies, you can, you, can, you can pick up the book of Revelation and you can look at it like you're looking at, 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 a child, at a child's storybook. You can go to any page and tell exactly what is happening here. You can fit it into the bigger picture. This way, we can be in harmony with God's purposes. We can be in sync with what God is doing. And as a matter of fact, I find that it, it opens up the, the entire Bible and the plan of salvation makes everything much, much more reasonable and easy to understand. So anyway, we're going to go now to the Bible and we're going to pick up from where we left off last week 
in looking at the description of the beast, the, the, the description of the establishment of the mark of the beast. So we need to go to Revelation chapter 13. Okay. So we were down at the very end of the chapter last week. And we what, what we did last week, maybe I should bring up that screen as well. What we did last week was look at, um, where is it? I'm sure I have it somewhere. Okay, not this one. Hmm. Right, this is what we, we looked at last week. The last thing we looked at was the, um, the comparison of Romans chapter 1 in the right panel with the elements of the three, the third angel's message. And we saw that there are at least 12 points that we could look at where it seems like they are almost an exact parallel. Like Romans chapter 1 was designed to fit into the third angel's message. And based on this, I suggested that it seems like the issue of the mark of the beast is very closely related to what is described in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 shows us that when, when God has been, has been known to a society and the society rejects God, turns away from God, rejects the light that has come to them, the, the consequence, the natural consequence is that such a society turns to the worship of the things of creation. It was, it was more gross and, and basic and, and, and primitive in ancient times. It's more sophisticated in our time. But the principle is the same. You reject God, what do you turn to? You turn to yourself and you turn to the things that are created. And so you, 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 you make these created things into an image or an idol that you begin to worship. What Paul highlighted is that the consequence of this is, first of all, exaggerated homosexual behavior. In these societies, the first and the most outstanding feature is exaggerated homosexual behavior. It begins to take over the, the society. A striking testament to what is happening in the world today. So the point is, if you can look at this in Romans chapter 1, and you see that Romans chapter 1 parallels the third angel's message, there is reason to suppose that the third angel's message just might have something to do with the same issue of homosexual behavior. Now, if this was the only thing we could look at, I would mention it. And then, you know, we could leave it alone and not, not even think about it again. But it seems to me that there is more than this. There's more than this. So I'm going to go to, again, to the Bible, look at the three angels' messages. And um, I'm going to note something that it says about the third angel's message. Now, we will come back to Revelation 13. I'm not finished with it by any means. But let's just for a moment step over to Revelation 14. And look at the third angel's message since we are here already and we are discussing this issue of romans compared to the three messages i want to read what it says i want to remind us of what it says as a matter of fact let me read all three angel, three messages it says in verse 6 revelation 14 from verse 6 and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud, a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. I have to pause on that just to remind us of the significance of this. I am persuaded, and I think the people who are understanding, you are beginning to, to get it as well. The, the subject of judgment is one of the great themes of the Bible. I never got it before i have it now the, the the subject of judgment is one of the greatest issues in the bible everybody in this room i believe should begin to get that because 
The judgment has to do with, with vindicating the name of God, the justice of God, the government of God, the judgment. God does not move unless there's a judgment because God will be justified before he does anything because he's not running a dictatorship. He's running a, a government where he governs by the choice of the people. So no move is made unless there is a judgment. God's throne is to be established through the judgment. So when it says the hour of his judgment is come, we have come to a moment when, you know, people believe that it is man who is to be judged. It may be true in a limited sense because the two kingdoms are being judged. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is when you judge the kingdom of Christ, the question is, what does the government of God accomplish? It's God's government that is in question. It's not, it's not, it's not whether you or I are going to be saved. That is the greatest issue. That is important to me. That may be the most important thing to me, although maybe not anymore. But, you know, for each of us, that may be the great question. But for the universe, that is not the greatest question. The greatest question is, does the government of God produce the goods is is this government the one that is qualified to rule forever and ever is it so good that it is qualified to last forever and the question is important because the devil said that it was not the devil brought in lies to suggest that god's government was not the best so anyway when it says the hour of his judgment is come we're talking about the judgment that is to vindicate the name of God. Yes, and we understand, we of all people understand very well that we are talking about God's government revealed through his church, through his kingdom. We are the objects who are examined to vindicate the name of God. What is different in what we are saying is that everybody believes we are examined to jeopardize our salvation. We are examined to see if we are, we are clean and we are pure so we can be saved or lost. But the truth is, the only reason why the spotlight is shone upon us is because of what Jesus said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, we, 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 the church, the kingdom of Christ does come under the microscope, but it is not about how to save men. It is about vindicating the name of God. It's about glorifying the name of God. That is why the last church is perfected. That is why the 144,000 are, are prepared. That is why we, the children of the Lord who are understanding this, have this burning in our hearts to represent him the right way. If it were not for this, I would say, Lord, put me to sleep and let me, let me go like the thief on the cross. Let me go rest and lie down until Jesus comes again. It wouldn't matter. But there's a war for the kingdom. And I am glad to be involved. I want to be involved. And I want to be one of the persons of whom it can be said, this 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 is one of those that the lord used in the last great work so anyway and this is why it says the hour of his judgment is come and we are we are, we are directed or we are to direct worship to our creator the lord god of heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters like jesus said okay even when I look at the Lord's Prayer, I, I am motivated and moved because look at what it says. The last thing that Jesus says when he says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It starts with, it starts with focus on God. Your kingdom come. It's about God and his kingdom. The very prayer that we are taught to pray, the first thing is God's name, God's character, and God's kingdom, God's government. And it ends by saying, for thine, is the, uh, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's prayer is about the, the, the glory and honor of the Lord God 
And in the middle somewhere, there's a little bit about us. But the little bit about us is a given, you know. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our, 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 our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. A prayer for God's guidance and protection. But it begins and ends with the glory of God, which is so appropriate. Now, so, we, we brothers and sisters, we have a message to preach about the judgment. And it's, it's, it's exciting. It's not, like, it's not like we understood the judgment to be a fearful thing because our name can be called at any moment and we are, we are in danger of losing our soul. It's not about us. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something to, to charge into with your, with your guns blazing or with your sword unsheathed because we are, we are on, on the battle for our God and our King and our kingdom. It's an exciting time. It's the conclusion of the ages and we are in the middle of it. So we have a message for the world and it's about the judgment. It's about the judgment, the judgment of our Father's kingdom. It says in verse 8, And there fallen another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Let me just interject quickly. You know, I've heard people saying, and people that I believe should know better, I've heard people saying that Babylon is a particular location on planet Earth. I've heard people saying that it's the Vatican. I've heard people saying it's New York City. Some say it's Paris. Those are the main victims I've, I've heard of this, this erroneous teaching. The reason, one of the main reasons why that, that does not make sense is because later on in Revelation 18, it says Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people. If Babylon is the Vatican, then the only place God's people are to leave is the Vatican. And if Babylon is New York City, then the only what God's people need to do is get out of New York. And if, if, the, if Babylon is London or Paris, or, all God's people need to do is get out of those cities. It's nonsensical, to be honest, to be generous. Babylon is, is a great system of false religion that envelops the world and when god says babylon is fallen i believe what happens and we are going to see more clearly is that the mark of the beast enters the religious systems the mark of the beast or the abomination of desolation enters into the religious systems and when the abomination of desolation stands in the place where it should not stand, which is the religious system, the systems dedicated to the worship of God. This is the mark for God's people to get out. Leave immediately because it says if you stay there, you will partake of her sins and you will, re will receive of her plagues. This is what the second angel's message is about. It is, it is a call to come out of the denominations. Now, somebody, somebody may ask me, is it time to call the people out of the churches? Well, I will say, I will explain the problem with denominations. And if somebody wants to come out, I will pat them on the back and encourage them and I'll help them. But I don't believe I have a clear message. We have a clear message to tell people to get out of the churches yet. Why? Because I think, according to the scriptures, the time is when the mark of the beast is established and when it enters into the churches, into the denominations, into the religious institutions, that is a time when nobody can remain there. At the moment, we can still have Christians who are there. And of course, they are in a, they are in a, 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 a dangerous place. But it's not yet at a place where, look, if you are in there, you are lost. That time is coming, and, and the, the Lord says it has to do with the time when the mark of the beast is set up. So when we see this abomination standing in the holy place or in what is considered to be the holy place, just like the Jews thought Jerusalem was a holy place, when that happens, then it is time to get out. Now, here we see the second angel flying. In chapter 13, we had the mark of the beast established. That's what we saw. And so now it says... Fear God, because the hour of his judgment has come. And the second message is, get out of the religious institutions. Why? Why is this such a big thing? Because 
The place of safety has always been the religious institutions. They have always been considered God's representat representative bodies upon this planet. People go there naturally for refuge. God says, get out. So at this moment, this is God's final call. This is the time when the kingdom of God is to appear in its beauty, when the 144,000 is to be made up. Get out of the denominations because if you stay there, you're going to jeopardize your, you're going to lose your soul because all the religious institutions, all institutionalized religion will bow to the mark of the beast. Those that might refuse to bow, what will happen to them? They will cease to exist. They will cease to exist. No public institution can survive the mark of the beast crisis. They all must bow because it will be universal and global. Look here. We individual Christians will just barely escape because God will be over us. You know why they can't get us? Because we're not congregated and clumped together in denominations. The Lord says that he will say to the reapers, gather first the tears in bundles. Gather them in bundles to be burned. The, 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 the people who are who don't have spiritual insight, they are gathering in bundles for the burning. They are joining their political parties, their denominations, their social clubs. They are getting into places where the voice of the majority carries. The mind of a few people control the masses. That's the danger of being gathered together in a bundle. And that is what happens. That is why the only people who will be able to escape are the people who are mavericks uncontrollable some people might refer to them, to them as offshoots because they, they, they are not they are not in a bunch where the authorities can get to them quickly they are individuals but they are all individuals with the spirit of christ in them so they will be a trouble they will be a trouble to those who want to take absolute control of everything so babylon is fallen and this second angel's message is a message to get out of the religious institutions so god deals with there's a general message for the whole world that says the hour of his judgment has come then there's a message for the religious bodies and thirdly there's a last warning for those who actually are receiving the mark and it says in verse 9 and just bear with me i'm sniffling a little bit this evening for some reason i hope um after the meeting, I'll go get a nap and everything will be all right. In verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sniffling, so please bear with me. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So this is a strange message. And everybody can recognize it's strange because it has elements in there that are clearly contrary to the character of God and contrary to our, our understanding of the way God does things. Elements that are clearly symbolic. Now, it says the person will drink of the wine. You know it's not wine. And you know they're not going to be drinking anything. But God is describing an experience and he's describing it as drinking wine. And what wine is it? The wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out unmingled, without mixture into the cup of his indignation all of this is one one sentence of describing something and, and what it is really describing is the seven last plagues okay the, the when it talks about the wrath of god anywhere in the book of revelation it's talking about the uh the seven last plagues and i'll just remind you of that very quickly by looking at revelation 15 where it says um give you the king james version I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. 
the wrath of God, the fullness of God's wrath is found in the seven last plagues. And what it means is that when it says the wrath of God, it is talking about the worst thing that God can do to anybody. The wrath of God. And when you think of this, you can go to what happened to Jesus on the cross. On the cross, Jesus suffered the wrath of God. The worst thing God can do to any person happened to Jesus on the cross. And what was it? God left him completely alone. That is the fullness of the wrath of God. Now, tradition and... Um, Maybe the way we use language, we come to think of wrath as anger, as violent anger. And so when we talk about the wrath of God, most people expect that God gets violent, God gets uncontrollable, and he starts throwing lightning bolts around. And this is a cliche that we have in our mind because of the misconceptions that have built up there over the years. But the wrath of God, when you go to the Bible, really means the worst thing that God can do to any living being, and that is to leave them completely alone. It is what Adam should have experienced in the garden. But Christ stepping in, it never happened. But Christ bore it on the cross because he took Adam's place. And now you see, at the end of time, those who have rejected Christ in this last message, they experience it. They suffer the wrath of God. The fullness of God's wrath is the seven last plagues. So God tells us clearly here in chapter 14 in the left panel, those who... Worship the beast, receive his mark. Re worship his image and receive his mark. They will drink the wine. God describes it as drinking something. You are taking in the fullness of that wrath of God, which means that you are left completely alone. You will experience it to the fullest extent. Or they will. Let me not say you. Let me not put any negative mouth on anybody. They will experience it to the fullest extent. And it is poured out without mixture, meaning that there is no element of grace or mercy. God is not going to dip in his finger a little bit now and then or try to, to ease it up. It will be the fullest experience of what a planet can go through when God is out of the picture. That is why the seven last plagues will be the, the most terrible catastrophes that have ever taken this planet. Of course, God will still be with his people. That's the exception. Individually, he will, he will be with those people and he will, he's the only reason why they survive. <laughs> now it says, those who receive the mark of the beast shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now there's a principle. I know most of us are familiar with this, but let me highlight it. There are some who are not. <sighs> the sniffling is getting really bad. I hope it's not annoying. I know it can be annoying, but brothers and sisters, I don't have a choice. So bear with me. I'm going to stop as soon as we get to 4.30. So, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. One of the principles we have learned is that when we are looking at the prophecies of Revelation, a high percentage of the time, we have to go to the Old Testament to find the meaning so we are looking for, can we find any place in the Old Testament where it says that somebody went through this experience, tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. This is what will happen to those who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark, tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the whole angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and they have no rest day or night. That's the sentence. How many things are there? Tormented with fire and brimstone, that's one. In the presence of the angels, that's two. In the presence of the Lamb, that's three. The smoke of their torment goes up forever, that's four. And they have no rest day nor night. That's five things it says will happen to those who receive the mark of the beast. So, we are looking for some place in the Bible, somewhere else where this is mentioned. That will help us to understand what is being said here. Because you know this is not literal. God is not going to torment anybody with fire, literally. And this, the torment continues forever and ever. 
No. Some people believe in eternal burning hell. We know that's a fallacy. Maybe this is one of the same passages that they use to, to support that idea, but that's a fallacy. Nobody is going to be tormented forever and ever. Not as we understand torment. This is a coded message. It's, it's something that is written in a kind of code, and God is telling us to understand this. Go back and try to find where it happened before. And so, I saw Brother Judah commenting in the chat. So we go back to where this happened. The only time it ever happened in the Bible before was in, in Sodom. Now, I want to highlight Sodom because when we talk about Sodom, let's look at the elements. Let's look at what happened in Sodom. All right, look for the meaning of the symbols in the Old Testament. Yes. Now I'm going to compare the verses in Revelation with the verses in, in Genesis. I'm going to compare the third angel's message with what happened in Sodom. Revelation 14, 9 to 10. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. First point. Genesis 19, verse 24 says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. That point number one is a perfect parallel. Point number two, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's um, what we're going to look at in the presence of the holy angels. That's Revelation 14. What do we see when we go to Genesis? We see that it says that when Sodom was destroyed, Genesis 19, verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy, thy two daughters which are here. Two angels, <coughs> two angels came down to Sodom, and they are the ones who destroyed Sodom with fire and brimstone. It was in the presence of the angels, at least two of them. It says, and of course we know that the Lamb or Jesus Christ was there also. He was talking with Abraham. Abraham walked with him and he talked with, with, with the Lord. And Abraham tried to persuade him to spare the city if he found so many righteous people there. And the Lord actually agreed that if he found ten righteous there, he would have spared the city. But there were not ten. So the Lord was there and the angels were there. It was in the presence of the holy angels. And in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, Revelation 14, verse 11, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What about the smoke of their torment going up? Where do we find that in Genesis in the story of Sodom? It says in the morning, Genesis 19, 28, when Abraham got up. He went quickly to see what was going on because his nephew was down there. It says, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of this, the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. It even says the smoke went up. It, uh, it, it mentions going up just like it says in the three messages. The smoke of their torment ascends up. But it also says that it ascends forever and ever. All right. What does that mean? The smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Revelation 14, 11. In Jude 1 and verse 7, it says, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Notice, Jude refers to the fire that destroyed Sodom as eternal fire. So, when you see in Revelation, it says, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. It's focusing on the eternal nature of what happened to Sodom. It's focusing on the eternal nature of what happens 
to those who worship the beast and his image. The message, in fact, is pointing to Sodom. Fire and brimstone in the presence of the angels and the Lamb, the smoke of their torment ascend. They suffer eternal punishment. That's what we are looking at when we look at the message to Sodom. Why does God point us back to Sodom? Well, remember what we saw in, in studying Romans chapter 1. The mark of a society that rejects God, the prominent mark, is that the society turns to homosexual behavior. This is a second indication in the three angels' messages that is pointing us to this issue of homosexual behavior. Why does it say they have no rest day nor night? We tend to interpret this as saying that there is we tend to interpret it as saying that there is eternal torment, no rest, unceasing, unrelenting torment. But when we apply New Testament principles, what do we see? Look at what the Lord says in Hebrews chapter 3, 18 and 19. It says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into what? Into his rest. But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. When it says they have no rest day or night, we assume that it means they have no rest from torment. But what it means is that they have, I mean, the way I would interpret it is that there is, they never have any spiritual rest. This is over. No salvation, no hope, as Brother Judah says. There is no rest day nor night. They never have rest in their spirit. And in a second sense, they have no relief. The sentence that is passed upon this upon those who receive the mark. There is no rest from it. It will never cease. You know that the wicked who died in the past, there will be a moment when they are raised back to life. The rest here, that is, is sometimes interpreted to mean that there is no ending to the torment. It means something else. It just simply means that this sentence, there will never be any relief for it. They will never come back to life. The, 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 the sentence the sentence of complete separation from God is forever and they will never have spiritual rest again so the real the real critical question is this is there any justification that we can make for suggesting that this mark of the beast might have something to do with the present push that we see in society to bring in this strange situation where sexual perversion is becoming the norm is there any reason is there anything that we can we can see to bring us to this conclusion now let me emphasize when it comes to unfulfilled prophecy i always walk softly one of the things i've learned in my life is that i am not a prophet and so I speak as a Bible student, I speak as a teacher, but not as a prophet. A prophet doesn't make mistakes, but a teacher is working with the best evidence that he has. And so he's presenting ideas that he believes make sense, but I'm not a prophet. But when I look at the Bible and I look at these, these situations, I believe that there is strong evidence pointing in the direction of homosexual behavior. Some things are not yet clear to me, but the, 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 the evidence is so pointed that it has not left my mind. So, could it be multifaceted? I believe in a sense it is multifaceted, but um, at least in the third angel's message, why does God point to Sodom? Why? Why, why the striking focus on Sodom? When, when we believe that the third angel's message is just ta take, talking about what, how God will punish people, then Sodom is eliminated. Okay, God is going to torment people with fire and brimstone. And the angels are going to watch and Jesus is going to be standing there watching as well. And the people who are being tormented will have no relief. They'll be tormented day and night. And while they are being tormented, smoke will be rising. 
That's the literal popular interpretation. God tells us to go and preach a message that those who receive the mark of the beast are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever. And Jesus and the angels will be there watching. That is our message. For me, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be much of a message. Okay? Even though in the past, I tried to carry it. But it doesn't seem to be at all in synchronization with what we see as we are beginning to understand Revelation. Far more reasonable to me is that God is saying, if you want to understand this message, go and look at where it happened before. So you go to Sodom. Why Sodom? Because God is saying, somewhere in what happened to Sodom, you will, you will discover clues to what the mark is about. When you combine it with Romans chapter 1, you see that Paul emphasizes that when a society rejects God, the first great sign is that the society turns to homosexual practices. Now things begin to come together in a more striking way. Now it be begin begins to become difficult to avoid the implications of what is being said. Let me show you another place also in the book of Revelation, which also supports this emphasis. Like I said, we can only share ideas. Only God knows for sure. The other place in the Bible is Revelation chapter 11. When you go to Revelation chapter 11, look at what it says. Now we know that the two witnesses represent God's last day people. Um, primarily, we would say the one for the 4,000 who go out to give that last message. They are preaching clothed in sackcloth. The two witnesses. It says, when they shall have finished their testimony, verse 7, Revelation 11, verse 7, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, I don't believe this has anything to do with literal Sodom. Literal Sodom is somewhere under the Dead Sea. Most of it, parts of it might still remain on the banks of the Dead Sea. Literal Sodom is gone. God says spiritually. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the spiritual elements of Sodom and also Egypt. Now, I'll come to the other one in a moment. But when you look at Sodom and Egypt, what God is saying is that the spiritual qualities that were embodied in Sodom and Egypt, these are the conditions that will exist in the world when the two witnesses are killed. Now, we understand that the death of the two witnesses refers to what we call the close of probation, the end of grace. It's the last thing that will happen to mark the end for both kingdoms. This is the time when the seven plagues begin, right after the two witnesses are killed. Now, it's the same thing that is, it says the same thing in, in the book of Daniel. If I can just look quickly at Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. It says, it talks about the, the power that would be attacking God's people and how long would these things continue. And it says that um, the man, I heard the man, verse 7, Daniel 12, verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. When he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and he swore by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half, three and a half years. That's the time of the tribulation. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, that's the death of the two witnesses. All these things shall be finished. All right? So, when the two witnesses are killed, he will have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. God's people will have no more power to reach anybody. Probation is closed. Grace is over. The Spirit has left. The only condition that is left on this planet is Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. So, it says... What we are really looking for is a spiritual condition. And what was it about Sodom and Egypt? Well, first of all, and, and also our Lord was crucified. What, what do Sodom and Egypt 
and Jerusalem when the Lord was crucified. Notice it's not Jerusalem, it's Jerusalem at a certain point in time. What do these three cities have in common? Well, I'll tell you. Sodom was a place where the Spirit of God had departed. Jerusalem, when, when the Lord was crucified, was a place where the Spirit of the Lord had departed. Egypt, at the time of the Exodus, was a place where the grace of God abandoned Egypt. That night, the angel of death passed over. So we are talking about, this is a marker in the book of Revelation that is pointing us to the end of probation. It's pointing us to a time when the world has reached a place where God's spirit is no longer working. And God describes that situation as Sodom and Egypt. What do we see in Sodom and Egypt? Well, honestly, when you look at Sodom, there's only one thing that can come to your mind if you're a rational person. The only people who can look at this and find something else are the homosexuals who are trying to twist and pervert the Bible. And what do we see when we look at Egypt? When we look at Egypt, what we see is blatant, bare-faced defiance of God. That's the mark of atheism. That's the mark of the beast who comes from the bottomless pit. This is the condition of the world in the last days. It's not a world where they have turned to religion and the religious is fighting against the religious. Sunday keepers against Sabbath keepers are so on. No, no, no. What this is is a world that has defied its creator, rebelled against God, violently embraced the most anti-God principles and demands that everybody accept these principles. God embodies it god represents it as sodom and egypt so what i what i believe this is is a world in which the entire planet has turned to defiance of god and the outstanding mark of that defiance is that rampant sodomy permeates the whole society to the point where certain elements are legislated by law now, don't ask me how, because I don't know. I don't know how exactly they, they would institute something like this. I know that we can look at examples, right? I know that in, in the recent crisis, what they did was you could not remain at your job. You could not visit the hospital. You could not go to the post office unless you, you bent to what was demanded. I know that even in terms of the homosexual movement, I know that people have lost their jobs because they would not. And it's not just homosexuality, it's the whole perversion. If you call somebody he when, he, when a bearded man says, I'm a lady, you have to say she, or you have to say they, or Z, or whatever perversion they take, take upon themselves. And if you don't, you lose your job, or, or, or you're ostracized. It takes just a, a finger's breadth for them to find a way to make this a crisis like they did with the recent situation that I may not name. But it takes just a, 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 a little hand's breadth for them to do something like this. We don't know how, but they will find ways to do it if what the Bible says is true. Now, I could be very wrong. I'm the first to admit that I could be very wrong. Okay? But what I, I said, I'm holding to that. What I'm doing is looking at biblical evidence and trying to make a conclusion from the Bible. I'm not running around following the internet. I'm not running around coming with, with, with scatterbrained ideas. I'm trying to go by what I'm seeing in the Bible. So I may be wrong, but if I'm wrong, you will know that I'm wrong following sound principles. I hope you will at least give me that. At, at the very least, I'm asking you to consider what I'm presenting.